very much for saying yes to do this interview. You're welcome. Okay. We will focus on the lifestyle and the mindset. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, by many people's uh, standards, you are an example of how to live happy and successful life. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, what we would like to, to kind of get a little bit inside of your head mm -hmm. and to uh, discover maybe how to combine the qualities that you managed so far. Okay. And yeah, how do you wake up? What do you think? How, how your day goes by? And uh, we, I would like to start with your childhood, how this mindset developed. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are now a successful founder and owner of Property 118. Yep, well, part owner, but definitely the founder, but yeah, mm -hmm. part owner of Property 118. Uh, and you have just uh, recently relocated to Malta, yep. to this uh, stunning place with a gorgeous view. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah, you have lots of smiles uh, on your pictures, Absolutely. and many people follow you and learn from you. Um, so how did it all start? So going back to childhood, uh, just a very sort of average life. Um, my family all grew up on council, council estates, yeah. just a, a very working class uh, religious family. Um, so I guess my morals and my ethics come from that sort of religious background, even though I'm not particularly religious myself. Uh, I think that part of it came from there. Uh, all of my family are hard working people, they're working class people um, and we never really had much money in my childhood uh, so if I wanted something mum and dad would say well you better find a way of earning it, earning it then because we can't give it to you because we haven't got it so uh, when I was probably just pre-teens even maybe 11 or 12, 13 at, at the most uh, I used to go knocking on people's doors with my bucket and sponge saying, would you like me to clean your car? Wow. And people said yes. And I remember when I was 13, I actually had nine people working for me because I had the courage, I guess, to go and knock on the doors. Um, and other kids would see what I'm doing and like, what are you doing? Why are you washing that man's car? And say, oh, I charge a pound for washing his car. Oh, well, can we help you? If we you want us to clean the wheels and we'll do the roof and what have you so I'd say yeah yeah of course you can help me and soon enough I had enough people helping me wash the cars that I'd then be knocking on the next door and I was taking a little bit from all of them so yeah I guess that kind of entrepreneurial spirit was I didn't consider myself an entrepreneur at 12 or 13 years of age it was it was a need. I was satisfying a need. I wanted some money. You know, my some of my friends were getting like nice trainers or jeans, and my parents couldn't get them for me. So they said, "Well, if you want a pair of those nice trainers or jeans or a leather jacket, or you want to go to the school disco, you better go out and wash some cars." So that's what I did. So it wasn't entrepreneurial. It was just life. Okay. So now, do you do you like want something more and consider? Okay, what can I do to? to have this boat or whatever. Do you set goals? Do you have like uh, figures in mind? I did set goals for a very, very long time. So mm -hmm. I actually kept, um, so sort of rewind to my late teens, if you like. So mm -hmm. I'd left school at 16 because that's what working class people did. We didn't go to university, you know, posh people did that. That was kind of my upbringing. That was the mindset that, that my parents gave to me. So it was like, you gotta go out and get a job now. You've left school, you're 16 years of age. Uh, when I was 19, I went from working in factories to selling life insurance. And um, that's when I started learning about goal planning. Uh, I guess, like everybody, you know, people have different definitions of goals. So some people dream about owning something. It's usually material is where goals start and then it, it moves on to being able to help other people and, and, and so on, it develops. Um, but like any teenager, I wanted to have a nice car, uh, so that was a goal. Um, but when I really started getting into goal planning, I realised that you've got to write it down. So okay. I, I created a book of goals and people took, you know, they took the mickey out of me a little bit because 
I was sort of this teenager into, into goal setting and goal planning. But for years, one years, one years, every Saturday I used to get my book of goals out and on a big goal, I would write the goal title on the top of the page and that might be, for example, House in Florida. Uh, just a dream, if you like. Every, you know, somebody's got a dream, they want to have a holiday home or whatever. So I remember, if I talk about that one specifically, because I think that's quite an interesting mm -hmm. one, I said, holiday home in Florida. Actually, I put, I'd love to own a holiday home in Florida. And then I started adding details. So that's why I left the two pages free. Because I think the more clear your goal becomes, the more passionate about having the goal, it's almost like you can touch it and feel it. It becomes a reality before it actually is a reality. Mm -hmm. So it started with, I'd love to own a home in Florida. And then it uh, progressed to on a hill overlooking a lake. And then I added that I could visit in the winter. And then I started planning and adding the details. I want wooden floors, I want a single story, I want a minimum two car garage. Uh, and I started adding all this detail, you know, the colour of the piano, absolutely everything. So pages and pages of notes on what my dream home would look like. And massive coincidence on that one, uh, bearing in mind all the, my original criteria, my address was Hart Lake Hills Winter Haven. <laughs> now, was that coincidence? Was that the universe giving something back to me? I don't know. But hey, if I hadn't written the goals, would I have achieved that? Again, I don't know. But it's kind of, it's a little bit of magic that's happened in my life if I've written down these goals and kind of developed a burning desire to achieve something as if by magic, somehow, with hard work, determination, working smart, uh, following my ethical integrity uh, guidelines, if you like, it's materialized. Okay, so, uh, you know, when you have friends around, you you are the most generous, the most kind person I ever knew. Well, that's really nice. <laughs> so... I'll have to tone that down a bit, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, do you believe that you, cre you create that success because you are so generous and the universe of God gives you? Or you are successful and therefore you can afford to treat everyone to champagne and um, meals and invite friends? I think it's a little bit of both. Okay. So, um, obviously you can't be overly generous to the point that, you know, you can't afford to pay your own bills, for example. So, the fact that, yes, I am generous, I've always been generous, but you can't give more than you've got. Mm -hmm. um, so, you have to look after yourself first? Absolutely. For, for me, it's of itself and family first, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then what's left over is is friends, and then you know other interests that that I can get a buzz from. So I'll give you an example of that. Property one one eight wasn't about making any money. Uh, Property one one eight was having achieved the material things that I wanted to do in life and having retired from, at a very early age, from a really, really successful business, I sat on a beach for three months and I got completely bored and somebody said to me, Mark, you've had some, such amazing experiences, you know, with goal planning, you've been successful, you've owned the supercars, the big houses, and all the things that most people only ever dream about owning and having, why don't you write a book? And I really tried and I got to about chapter three and there was no engagement, there was no interaction. I realised that the reason that I was getting bored was it was that, that social interaction with other people in business. So that's why I created the blog. Mm -hmm. uh, and Property 118 was just a blog to start off with and it was me sharing best practice. And I got really motivated and got a real buzz when people would comment on the blog or send me an email and say, you know, that changed my life, you've really inspired me, that's really helped me solve that problem. So I thought, oh, this is, this is great, you know, we'll, we'll invite more people because there's people with a lot more experience than me at being a landlord uh, and investing into property. So I invited other people to write guest blogs and then I invited people to uh, submit readers' questions. And I just got a real buzz from helping those people and they got a real buzz from helping each other. And now that community is 200,000 people all helping each other. 
Uh, and it, that has, it was never an intention to build a business out of that when we first started doing it. Uh, but of course, we've now got sponsors. It worked on donations. People said you can never run a business on donations. You know, people will just take, 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 and they'll never give you anything back. But actually, it works. It works for us. Yes. It's not going to make us millions. It's not going to buy us boats and helicopters and yachts and holiday homes. But it, it provides a living for, you know, a reasonable living for four people, and it's constantly growing. But I think that the real feedback and the buzz from that is knowing that we're helping so many more people. Some express it. But for everyone that expresses their gratitude, there are thousands of others, of others that we're helping to achieve their life goals or solve their problems. Mm -hmm. So that's a real buzz. So now you can run your business from anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. you travel a lot. Do you now set your goals? Do, no. you, do you want more? Do you... Materially, I'm really, really happy. Um, so. My, I want to have my family to experience what I'm experiencing, my friends experiencing, which is why you're here. I want to showcase that. Uh, in terms of material goals, no, I kind of guess that uh, I found my level on that. You know, great, if I have some more money, then I'll help more people. That's mm -hmm. great. And I'm no billionaire, please don't get me wrong. You know, we, we live a comfortable lifestyle and we enjoy doing things. Um, but what I'm building now is more for self-satisfaction uh, and, and that self-satisfaction comes from helping other people rather than building a business as such. And I guess there's a little bit of ego in there as well, you know, having already done it, if I can build something else and say, you know, that's mine, I, or that's partly mine, my team put this together and other people can be successful on the way, again, that's very inspiring to me. So it's not about me saving up to buy a new car or house or yacht or anything like that. It's about the buzz that it gives to me now. Okay. Have you done some letting go in life? And how did you cope if you did? How do you mean by letting go? Uh, something you lost, something you had to just say goodbye even if you All you the time. Think. All the time. Okay. Um, so... People think that you know, being aspirational is just about being successful, and it's not. You know, there are so many setbacks. So, and it's those setbacks that sort of ground us into reality. Mm -hmm. So, when I set up my commercial finance brokerage to start off with, we had no money. Uh, I'd walked away from a job in the early 1990s that was really well paid. It's 38,000 a year, which is still a reasonable salary today. Uh, but back then, it was like a quarter of a million pounds a year would be now. Mm -hmm. And I walked away from that, set up my own company, and myself and my business partner at the time, put 300 pounds each into the business. We bought two desks, one filing cabinet, one bin, two phones and a fax machine. The phone never rang. And we were like, ah, how are we actually gonna make any money? And it was coming up to winter, and I can remember going around Great Yarmouth, knocking on all the guest house doors, saying, we found a mortgage product that can probably save you money, would you like to talk to us about it? And that was in the wind and the rain and all of those sorts of things. And it's those experiences uh, that really sort of bring it home to you what you're actually doing. So we were genuinely helping people. Some people just felt sorry for us, <laughs> invited us into the guest house to warm us up and make us a cup of tea. Um, and it would have been very, very easy to say, just on that example, we'll walk away from it. And that's never changed. You know, when we set up Property 118 uh, to start off with, we were just pumping money into it. And it was getting crazy. Like, if we'd have carried on pumping money into it the way that we were, we'd have gone bankrupt, mm -hmm. even though we were very successful people. So, you know, you have to keep looking at these life experiences and saying, well, okay, was that a failure, was that something that we had to walk away from or was it something we changed and developed? And uh, one of my business partners, Neil, uh, hates my saying, ready, fire, aim. He says, it's, no, it's not ready, aim, fire. And I'd, No, it isn't. We won the First World War on this strategy where you dropped the bomb into the mortar and you saw where it landed and you adjusted your sights until it hit the target. And I think life and business and anything we do that's aspirational is a bit like that. You kind of know the direction you want to go in, you take a shot and it misses and then you readjust your sights and take another shot. So 
going back to you know the failures, you know, every miss is that a failure or is it one step closer to success? It's up to us. Absolutely, absolutely. I think too many people walk away from things and think, oh well, I tried that; it didn't work for me. Well, actually, you know. Edison found a million ways of not, make, 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 not making a light bulb work before he found a way to make a light bulb work. Mm. You know, if he'd have given up on the 999th time, we would be sitting here in the dark. Mm. So it's about going that extra mile. And if you really want to do something, you're really passionate about doing something, then just keep going. Keep going, keep, going, keep readjusting the sights, find a way. So do you have some days when, when something happened and you had just have to pull yourself up or they don't exist anymore? <laughs> it's really, really difficult to answer that question because my life is a constant series of setbacks like everybody else's. Okay. Yeah? Um, but I'm really happy with them. Mm -hmm. I guess I've learned to be happy with them. So, you know, I probably have more setbacks and more failures than most people because I try more things. The most people. Mm -hmm. So when you are experiencing, when you are going through hell, how would do you give yourself a cheer speech? How do you get to the point when when you get happy with well, being successful? Well, I've, I've never ever become successful by doing anything on my own. Okay. That's the really important part. Uh, and I don't think very many people ever do. So. I might have what I think is a good idea and I'll share that idea with other people and they'll say to me, yes it's for me or I really like that but I think we should do this and they'll kind of buy into and mould the idea to start off with. So if it's a rubbish idea and everybody tells me it's a rubbish idea, I'll probably park that one and come up with another idea. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, but once I've got a team of people around me who think, yeah, that's a really good idea, that's a good product, good service, good whatever, then they've kind of bought into it as well. And I never take 100% ownership of it. So I, you, when we right back at the start of this interview, you said I was the owner of Property 118, and I corrected you and said, no, I was the founder of Property 118, it was my idea, but I don't mm -hmm. own all of it. Um, so. There's, there's four owners of Property 118 in a, a legalistic sense, but the way I'll also look at it is there are 200,000 owners of Property 118, because if nobody read it, nobody commented on it, there would be no Property 118. Mm -hmm. So it's about getting the people to be part of that vision. And when you do that, then if something doesn't go right, you've got an instant support network. So you can say, okay, I didn't get the outcome that I was expecting from that, why do you think that is? So today's a classic example of that. You know, um, phenomenal business opportunity, didn't get the result that I was expecting. Is that a negative? No, am I depressed about it? Absolutely not, I'm drinking champagne, or I was two minutes before we started this interview. Um, why, because I learnt loads from it. Yeah? Uh, people love the idea, but I haven't quite got it right. Next time I present that idea, it will be different. It may be right, it may hit the target. If not, I'll readjust and, and we'll get there because I know that the, the, the product and service that I was putting together today is a brilliant idea. Everybody liked the idea, but it just wasn't quite right. So I just keep adjusting it until it is right. So it's that support network around me. So that's why I say I've never done it on my own. Okay. Yeah. So you started business very early mm -hmm. and there are people out there who want to be successful, who want more in life, but they are say 30, 40 years old. Is it... So how, how to get into that spirit, I guess, uh, to look for opportunities, to quit the job that perhaps they dislike? and to, you know, to live I'm life to the I'm probably not the, the right person to answer that question. I'll explain why. Uh, when I first became entrepreneurial, it wasn't because I had a desire to become entrepreneurial, it was because I had a desire to earn money and I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, when I decided to quit the well-paid job, I was 22 years of age. I had no family, no property, no car, no mortgage. I had nothing like that to worry about at that time. So 
it was a very different decision. Um, if I'd have been 30 or 40 years old with all of those uh, ties that life brings as, as we mature with like houses, cars, kids, etc., etc., mortgages, I don't think it would be a very different decision. And because I've never, uh, I didn't walk away from that sort of guaranteed safety net, so that's why I'm not really the right person to ask. Having said that, uh, 2009 was kind of a massive setback, so we were in a business that was making seven million pounds a year profit, so it was a very, very successful business. And the market changed and that stopped. Now, there's a few things I could have done, so I could have just sat on the beach for the rest of my life. Uh, being completely bored, being completely miserable, making other people's lives a misery, but at least I've had some money in my pocket. Or I could have, or I could have risked it and started building other things. So I kind of guess I have, but not quite leaving the stable environment that some other people can find themselves in. I, I do, I do see that, and I do see that it must be a more difficult decision than the one that I had to make. But. There are loads of people who've done it and they've been very successful. Mm -hmm. So you said that you have lots of people around you and lots of support, but when the time is really tough, do you, uh, do you get in touch with yourself more? Do you speak to God or is there anything like you use in your terms uh, to bring you that hope again that, uh, you know, Go and get uh, as I said, I'm not particularly religious. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would consider myself spiritual, but not religious. So no, I don't meaning, pray to God. Spiritual meaning? Um, I believe there's more to life than our physical existence on this planet right now. So you believe that you've been to this life before? I have or no ever? idea. I'd like to think there was another one, but I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy the one I've got right now. Yeah? Okay. Do you think that oh, you, you, we are immortal? Do you oh, absolutely immortal. we're immortal. I'll look out the window. <laughs> immortal? I, I, I saw it Did on the you? side and I bought the ticket. Yeah, I definitely I'm immortal. <laughs> Do you believe you will come back again into this life? I don't know. I, don't know. Uh, I think we, I, I'm spiritual, so I think there's more to life beyond the current life we've got. But I don't know what that is. Okay. Uh, so, you know, will I be reincarnated as an ant, a whale, or a person? I've no idea. Or will I be something completely different that I'm not even aware of the existence of? I think there is something, but I just don't know what it is. So I'm enjoying life as it is now. Uh, I definitely believe that we all have souls. If you want to go into kind of that deep, um, I think that we part of life is developing our souls. I think that souls split more than once so once the soul grows to a certain age and a certain level of having developed through its various life experiences humanity being one example of that um, then yes i think that those souls can split and actually live two lives or multiple lives at the same time and i think that's why we meet soulmates i think that's why we get on differently with different people I think that's why you meet young souls and old souls. You know, you, I don't know if you if you believe in that stuff, but I do. yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I definitely do. Uh, I got the feeling that I'm an old soul. I did this thing on Facebook that said I was an old soul, but I'm sure, that's not very scientific. But nevertheless, uh, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It, it's kind of rambled. The questions moved on a little bit. Okay. Um... What else I would like to know, if you don't mind, what is your current challenge? My current challenge? Uh, if there is any. Oh yeah, there's all, there always is, because I always want to do something different. So, I spotted an opportunity in the leisure market. Um, you know, everybody likes a nice holiday, everybody aspires to, to do different things with their leisure time, be it in retirement or just because they've got some disposable income or what have you. Um, I've been on good, bad and indifferent holidays. Uh, I'd like to help people to put within people's reach things that they couldn't ordinarily do. Uh, so like owning boats, supercars, holidays. 
Uh, and that's existed in various forms over the years, timeshare being one of them. Um, but I think there are there are different ways of doing it, and I think it's been done very very badly in the past. There are a few businesses that do it well, um, but people don't know how to differentiate between the good and the bad, and uh, so. I really do see that leisure activity uh, can be revolutionised and I'd love to do that because so many more people can benefit from the lifestyle I've enjoyed without necessarily having to earn the income that I've earned. Um, so an example of that is with the supercars, you know, you buy a Ferrari, fantastic, every boy's dream, own a Ferrari. What they don't tell you is it costs two thousand pounds every time you have to have it serviced. They break down all the time because they're a highly tuned machine. Um, they cost a fortune to garage. The depreciation on them is a nightmare. And so you get sort of maybe thirty hours of great fun driving time out of it for every year that you own it. Uh, but the best day is the day you buy it and the day you sell it. Is the reality. Um, and everybody else's faces when they know you've got a Ferrari. So you, you get two, you get two types of people. You, you get the people who sort of toss out as you drive past, and you get the people who go, "Oh, I want a Ferrari." Um, but having been a Ferrari owner, <clears throat> I thought I thought to myself, "Now, well, actually, there's a much better way of doing this. Uh, why don't you get a lot of people together who want to own a Ferrari and buy one between them and share the time out?" So it's a kind of timeshare, if you like, use that horribly. Uh, badly used phrase, but I, I think you can do that with things like boats, aeroplanes. In fact, people already do it, but they just mm -hmm. it's not been packaged in a way um, that can be properly commoditized and commercialized. So that's kind of my challenge. It's being done, but it's not very well known. And it's how do people differentiate and know that if I do this, the people that are working around me uh, are genuinely going to look after the car or the boat or whatever. How do I know that? If I want a holiday home, when I get there, it's going to be exactly the way I left it last time. I will get this with it, and all of that sort of thing. So yeah, that's a challenge. Uh, so a challenge to develop that industry. Well, I think the product and the industry already exists, but isn't particularly well known. So what I would like to do is develop um, that wisdom, develop the the marketing strategy, uh, develop the sales team, the marketing team, that can improve the awareness of where those quality products or services can be acquired, the aggregators of those products, the people who uh, will be able to buy and manage that boat properly and have multiple owners using it or the car or whatever it might be.